what I would uh, try to do today is discuss a little bit on India's urbanization, some implications for Pune, and in that light, talk about smart cities. Okay. What is the exact meaning of smart? On one side, it can be as broad as you want it to be. On the other side, it can be quite narrow. I'm particularly excited about Pune. Uh, and what I've found is, in fact, the, I won't call Pune as a second tier city, but the city just below the top city in the state normally has a huge set of degrees of freedom, you know. Okay, and of course, a lot of work has been already done. But when it comes to the institutional architecture and how to develop the city of Pune, already a lot of good work is happening. But can it take a trajectory increase is the problem statement I am taking. So this particular report, as I said, was, came out in 2010. Uh, since then, I must have presented it to at least, again, a few hundred government and uh, non-government uh, uh, people. Uh, and uh, more or less, I have found that everybody agreed with the diagnostics, even though not too many people have done much about it. Uh, we may be getting a sort of another chance when with this new cities coming up, including the new capital of Andhra Pradesh and so on that has been announced, maybe a brand new city, you can do everything from scratch. <laughs> but greenfield cities are very different from existing cities. So this particular chart shows that Urbanization is something, is a fact of life, okay. Uh, this chart shows the urbanization rate on the x-axis, which is the bottom axis, and the per capita GDP. So as the per capita GDP goes up, India is currently at 31% urbanization. It's an ongoing process and will reach 80 to 90%. So therefore, any of us who claim that urbanization has to be managed is just going to lose that particular battle. So as far as India is concerned, I already said the 2011 census says India is at 31% urbanization rate. And so another 300 million or 250 million people will move to cities in the next uh, next 20 years, from 2010 to 2011 to 2030, if you take that as a 20-year time frame, right? And for Pune also, you will find soon that somewhere between 2.5 to 4 million people will move into, uh, move into means they are not moving into from outside because a lot of it is organic growth. That is another misnomer. This is not all migration. A lot of it, 50% of it is just organic growth, uh, birth rate and so on. And some of it is migration. Okay, So that is the one. Uh, if you look at it, cities will account for 70% of India GDP by 2030. Uh, it's currently around, uh, uh, it was 58% in 2008. And 85% of the taxes. Next chart, please. Um, by 2030, around 10 states will be more than 50% urbanized. Goa and Mizoram are already 50% urbanized. Other, like Tamil Nadu and Kerala and Maharashtra are on the verge of 50%. That is the uh, yellow, uh, that is the uh, light yellow lines. But all of them will move from where between 60, 65%. Some of them will go above 50%, which will hopefully change the politics of the state, which is already, I think, beginning to change the po politics of these of these states. Right? Next chart, please. Uh, currently, there are 51 cities which are more than a million population. Uh, there will be 77 by, by 2030, right? Uh, and there will be a set of mega cities, 13 mega cities, which is uh, uh, which is more than more than 4 million. Now, if you start looking at the Pune numbers, and here they're just the type of uh, 13 cities will have a population of uh, uh, 4 million, uh, somewhere between 8 to 10 million, 80 to yeah, 60 to 80 billion dollars of GDP, okay, at, at 2008 dollars, and something like 7 to 10 thousand, uh, 7 to 8 thousand dollars of GDP per capita, and the the nature of that population, and this is uh, I'm not talking specifically on Pune, but all India, the nature of that population will also be very different and the young people that you were talking about and so on. If you look at the 2030, the number of deprived, which is people earning nine, less than 90, households earning less than 90,000 will, will go down from close to 40% to less than 15% and so on. So that was just, wait, wait, yeah. So that was just the thing related to uh, how cities, uh, overall India cities. Now what will happen going forward uh, if we uh, go with the current approach? <laughs> And this is very important to understand. You are seeing it in front of your, uh, in front of your eyes. But our sense is that current approach. Even if you start spending double the amount of money that you have today, 
it will still lead, in our opinion, to urban gridlock and decline. And it's a very important point to understand before we start thinking about what can be done. Okay. So currently, all over India, and we have also some numbers on Pune. You will have far better numbers. Okay, 105 liter per capita. I mean, this is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there's all types of benchmarks when a city comes to the hundreds of benchmarks we have selected. Uh, 10 or 12. I'll show you some of that. Water supply should be around 150 liters per uh, per capita per day. Public transportation share has declined to 30 percent. Pune, I think it is 20 percent. And these are just the benchmarks. I wouldn't go through all of them. The same benchmark in terms of uh, coverage and so on. I'll go to a transportation benchmark, which is quite interesting. Is on the next uh, next page, which we say the vehicular congestion. You see that in the middle. So I'm just saying, look, I, I, I'm not trying to purposely just paint a bleak picture. That is what the numbers are suggesting. Okay. That is what the numbers are suggesting based on whatever is being said. Now, of course, this Pune Metropolitan covers uh, the uh, the Pune Municipal Corporation, four neighboring municipalities. This data you know, around 5.88 million. If we go to the next page, I have already mentioned, sorry, this is the font is a little bit low, but Pune's overall benchmarks are very similar to the what I call the India average. So we are not necessarily that much better than India average. Maybe other than a couple of parameters, it says 97% of households are covered with municipal sewage systems. Uh, if that is so, then that is much better than benchmarks. But only 50% is treated, which is uh, slightly better than the benchmarks. But that also shows that Pune is right now no better than than average of, of India. I'll just show you the projection. Uh, next page. Uh, uh, OK, I, I'll come to that. Uh, this is just related to the population, around 33% population in PMC and 9% population in PCMC are estimated to live in slums. This was the latest survey next uh, so this was the uh, this was what the current trajectory is which uh, i already talked to you about the we took all the water projects that are there we doubled expenditure on the water project and say what is the future liter per capita that comes to 65 okay is currently at 105 so it's instead of going up it will go down i'm, I'm not saying that's true with pune but uh, that is generally true for all of india vehicular congestion uh, the number goes to 600 Slum population, in fact, the number increases rather than decreases on the current trajectory. Okay. So the question to you, as PIC, Janwani, government, is to say, can we, this trajectory is actually going down. Okay. It is definitely going down. You can see it around you. Okay. On all parameters, it will go down. Maybe one or two parameters, you can hold it. Okay. Can we fundamentally change this trajectory? And is it oxygen? I mean, is it is it possible to do that? And what, what does it take? The specific interventions we find across five areas are required to unlock the Indian cities. Unfortunately, in each one of them, you will find that there's a bit of a lack of political will to move to that level. And can that be can that be pushed with the people in this room plus people at large, right? So so let's talk about funding. We're common across cities. So all countries spent more than $300 per capita per year in capital expenditure on their large cities. Now, how do you fund that, right? The problem is that we are still not a rich country. And how do you fund that? So in all developing countries, uh, cities use land monetization, which we have talked about it, as a way of funding at least 50% of urban infrastructure gap. 50% of the urban infrastructure funding came from land monetization. Third one, all cities had systematic formula-based funding from central and state government, not on an ad hoc basis. All cities have strong, empowered, elected political leaders, at least as metropolitan mayors, whatever. Most of the, in most places in the world, they are called mayors. Okay. So they have been there, all, all cities, except one or two. Okay. All large cities had metropolitan structure and not just municipal structure. All have evolved urban planning systems with systematic uh, allocation for job creation, affordable housing, and public transportation. I'll come to that. And all cities, the last point is related to how do you govern, not through government departments, but through agency structure, through SPVs. Next. So this is just some of the numbers, right? So India, you, you remember the number 300 in mind. So India spends on average $58 in tier one cities per capita. So that is a six to one ratio. Tier two, we spend $14 and tier three, four, we spend $1 per capita per year. So our tier three cities look basically like villages. Right? There is no, almost no infrastructure. Right? Second, 
So the capital expenditure in India goes needs to go from $17 per capita to $134 per capita and the total number comes to $1.2 trillion. The Pune number, if you can just go to the Pune number, huh, just this, before this. Yeah. The Pune number is, and please keep this number in mind, $39 billion. So $39 billion over the next 20 years is 2,40,000 crores. Property tax and user charge mostly can pay only for ONM. Normally it cannot pay for capital charges, okay? Debt and PPP, again, hardly used by cities, okay, uh, is the third one. And direct support from the government, whether it's the JNN URM scheme or it's a directly state government giving you infrastructure projects, metros, this, that, okay, is the, is the, is the fourth one. Okay. So cities across the world have used this. When we started looking at Pune, at least we were able to, on an approximate basis, we were able to uh, uh, mass balance, not completely, maybe we wouldn't get to the $235 per capita per, uh, per year that we talked about, which is total $39 billion. But again, land monetization, debt PPP, and the direct support from the government is a uh, very important part, again, with the central as well as, well as the state. Right? Now, is this possible? If you look at this, this one complex, okay, the Bandra Kurla complex, the land monetization of that is funding all of Mumbai's infrastructure. All the big projects is being done by, this is a narrow area of a few hundred acres. Okay. So if you take the next chart, which is even more interesting, right, and our, again, the honorary commissioners will know, uh, the previous municipal commissioner, Subodh Kumar of Mumbai, who had now made sure that any additional FSI, that above one or whatever is the FSI, uh, whatever is the current FSI of Mumbai, 50% of that goes to the government. Okay, That rule came just last year or one and a half years ago. Just wanted to bring this experience on how to do land monetization. This is one thing, while only Mumbai did it, I don't think Pune has done this, right? And uh, this can be done throughout the metropolitan area, right? So this is just one example. So that was one, funding. Part number two is planning. Uh, planning is actually a scientific mathematical process. But 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 the simple 2030 master planning of, and it's a science, okay? I'm not saying that on, only a few of us can come together. But the master planning just does not get done, especially the metropolitan master plan. The municipal master plan may be getting done, but that's not enough. I'll just show you some examples. I'll just go to the next set of things. So there's a very scientific process. There's a 40-year there's a concept plan every metropolitan area has to go through. And Singapore is really a role model on that. Uh, the third one is uh, governance. I will not, I mean, I didn't get much uh, <laughs> much support on the governance side when I started talking about the metropolitan mayors and so on, because the chief minister was the first person who opposes this particular idea. But this is a reality. Again, keep it in mind. And the best place to do this is actually not necessarily at the municipal level, but if you bring this metropolitan concept you can bring a metropolitan mayor. It's a brand new form of, brand new layer of government applicable to only 50 cities in India, will go to 70 cities. You can bring a metropolitan air, mayor and you can directly elect it if required. This is what the Indian city is required. I know that it's, we are nowhere close and there is no politician currently talking about it, okay, including our prime minister. <coughs> uh, last point on governance. Uh, We'll go to the metropolitan area. Generally, again, this metropolitan municipal structure, which I'm happy that is coming in the Pune area, is a given structure in any large city, especially which has large municipality. You take Calcutta, which was the first city in India who, that implemented the 74th Constitutional Amendment, which said that there's the MPC, which is the Metropolitan Planning Council. Below that, there's a Metropolitan Authority, which is what you're trying to bring. And then below that, there's a municipality. Smart cities now. I'm taking the smart cities definition as a narrow sliver of a definition. The definition, the narrow definition is the deployment of technology to improve productivity, especially citizen facing productivity. That is the definition of a, a definition of a smart city, right? If we go to the next page, the one to 18 citizen services which are enabled by technology. It could be a a common fare card which can work between taxi, bus, and if there's a if there's a railway system, right? That I'm just I'm just giving you one example of that. So there's there's 18 technology. I think the city of Pune has to figure out since there's a smart city that is announced now. So out of the out of the 18 services, which one out of the 18 slivers of technology, which one will work? How do you how do you want to do that? And maybe you can even innovate even beyond these. Okay, I mean that next. 
So I wouldn't go, uh, go to this, but there are a number of cities around the world. You can go to the next one. Yeah. So the city of Lyon, for example, is considered one of the benchmarks, other than Singapore. Last, uh, last section, implication for Pune. I have only three, four charts. So really, I, I consider three types of initiatives for Pune. Okay? One is the foundational elements. The second is large investment programs and iconic projects. And the third one are quick wins. Okay? I already started spending some time on the foundational elements. Personally, I am quite passionate about it. I think Pune should absolutely insist on these foundational elements to this government as well as the new government that will come into play. When, uh, then, you know, there will be a whole set of 20-year projects that will come out. Obviously, out of that, the first five to 10 years will be most important. Agreeing on the division of projects between the metropolitan authority and municipal bodies will be very important and that's a process probably facilitated by either here or by the by the state government very important in the second point is related to large investment programs and the third point i'll uh, finish the third point which is quick wins i think everything you have been doing partly and at least what i have heard uh, substantial solid waste program a lot of sanitation program. I consider that to be quick wins. Nothing to be laughed at. Very important. Somewhere between one to twenty-five crores on a type of capex. These are these are lower capex one. Directly affect citizen satisfaction. Very important. Continue to do those, including the smart one. But please do move to number one and number two. Okay, which is both the foundation elements as well as the large investment program. For example, riverfront development. Okay, Pune has wonderful. Reverse, but we have done only, I think, one hundredth of what is required. You know, you can, and I know there are issues related to encroachment and cleanliness and so on. But if you go to the city of Seoul, uh, you know, just what they have done <coughs> with their river is just, uh, just uh, enormous, and it just completely changes the character of the city. And this is not a very high capital investment project. So, riverfront development, heritage development, I know you are already doing something, but again, can be fundamentally changed. Number. See, uh, last mile connectivity project, what I found that when large transportation projects come up, well, where they get stuck is the last mile. And the last one is related to master planning of various townships, including how Hinjewadi is coming and so on. All those areas can be planned, or maybe at least next set of areas can be planned much more wonderfully. Okay. Last chart. So what should be our response, right? Obviously, there's a whole set of responses going from from your head, I always I always say that one thing I I insist people that you know normally we ask the government to fix the roads. I always say that it is I and I have heard it with someone else. I say, in fact, a World Bank was not only asked to fix the roads but asked to fix the institutions that fix the roads. So I'll stop here. So that's the overall smart cities, smart Pune, smart urbanization. I'm hoping that Pune can indeed change its trajectory going forward. Thank you.